Welcome to Untold Stories of Innovation, where we amplify untold stories of insight, impact, and innovation. Powered by Untold Content, I'm your host, Katie Trout taylor Our guest today is Mike Tadasco, the Senior Director of Innovation at PayPal, and he is responsible for increasing the creative output of employees across the entire company. Mike, I'm so grateful to have you on the podcast today. Hey, Katie. Thanks for having me. So tell me a little bit about your personal story of innovation and what led you to PayPal. Oh, boy. My personal story of innovation, like probably with most people in this line, it starts when you're a little kid. When you're a little kid, you are innovating, you're building stuff, you're making connections that adults wouldn't otherwise see or anything like that. And and this wasn't anything unique to me. This is something that we all have. Um, and, you know, just I think sometimes maybe later in life, we need to re-embrace uh, that yes. inner child that we each have in each and every one of us. I love um, that. Can you, you know, paint a picture for us of, of a couple of moments that sort of you remember from childhood where you thought, gosh, I really love invention. Wow. Um, yeah. I mean, so look, uh, my parents, probably when I was 10 years old, got a Sony video camera. This was like a, like a Super 8 movie camera. Yeah. Um, and they got it for whatever, traveling and things like that, or whatever you did with a movie camera back in the 1980s. <laughs> um, but like, I took this thing because I'm like, th- this was amazing. And, and I got all my friends and we made movies and we did talk shows in our garage and <laughs> we did all of these kind of things. And like, I did this for years and this was back in the day where like, I was like literally editing between that and I had multiple VCRs hooked up. Um, you know, I was like, <laughs> and all of this stuff, like I wasn't splicing tape. I'm so envious of kids nowadays with oh, all their smartphones and like, my gosh, they could just edit these things digitally. But um, and I sound like an old man when I'm saying that. I guess I am. <laughs> um, but like Not that was quite. one of my first experiences of just really just creating something from nothing and and building a narrative around it and just and, and having so much fun doing it. Like that was one of my most uh, fun things that I ever got to do when I was a kid. So deep down, do you sort of wish that you were a YouTuber? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Don't we all <laughs> like, like we all want to be influencers, don't we? I mean, I, yeah. I was reading something where um, I think with uh, the, the Gen Z folks, like that is like the number one job uh, that most people in Gen Z want is to be an influencer, which of course, like wasn't even necessarily a concept uh, back when I was growing up. But like, yeah, no, there's something. And, and I love that. I, I do actually watch a lot of YouTube myself. And, and I love the concept of somebody just being able to pick up the camera Mm -hmm. who has a unique story and be able to tell it. I mean, that's the beautiful thing about YouTube is the amount of knowledge that is being passed across, like uh, across like geographical boundaries and all this kind of stuff. Like Mm -hmm. it is immense. Um, When I want to go deep into something like YouTube, candidly, is the first place I turn to to learn more about it. You know, I don't disagree. You know, everything from especially I think when it comes to issues like parenting or, or or even politics, it's really interesting to sort of dive into people's personal, like things that they might not reveal about their everyday lives. Even with your closest friends, sometimes it's hard to sort of break down that barrier. But um, but sometimes Absolutely. people can be quite quite candid to strangers, and yeah. it's helpful. You know, people are people are candid, and and the other thing that's amazing is just the long tail of it. Like I, I remember, I was um, changing. Uh, I was changing something on my car and it's like a 2011 Nissan. And this was a little while ago. And (laughs) literally I pull up YouTube and there's like the exact same car. There's a video for the exact same part that I wanted to change. And and like, I mean, that's the beauty of it. The long tail, like almost anything you imagine, almost any problem that you are having, someone else has had it. And you have this extremely shareable format where people can kind of put that up and maybe it's not polished, but it's still, it, it was, was able to save me a whole bunch of time from figuring some things out because someone else had who had that problem wanted to share that with others. I fixed my incinerator 
like my garbage disposal in my sink by myself. And I swear, <laughs> thanks to YouTube. And I did a little dance yeah. about it. And I called my mom. I was very proud of this yeah. moment. <laughs> but that's neither here nor there. Sink is not an easy thing. So no, it's you should have done a little dance. kind of intimidating. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so so you, fast forward a bit. You, you got your BS yeah. in finance from uh, University of Illinois. And you went to Cal yeah. Berkeley School of Business for your MBA. And you founded Sketch yeah. Maven. Yeah. Yeah. So, so um, well, look, and, and even to take a step before, like sure. the, the great thing about like being in innovation and all that, like there's, there's no like role that defines what you're going to do. I mean, I started off my career as an accountant. I mean, I mean, basically, I had like green visor and everything. Um, like, I was a stereotypical <laughs> accountant in my career. Um, I, I moved to do some environmental strategy stuff, some private equity, and then yeah, I went to to Berkeley, um, did an MBA there. And the first thing I did, as most people do when they're done getting their MBA, they decide they're going to create a comic book business, um, <laughs> and and that's of course what I did. Um, and, and look, this came from my childhood, um, to be clear. Like, so I was very much, I, I grew up in the 80s and 90s when uh, sports cards and like comic books and collectibles and like that were in this crazy boom. I remember um, those And days. like, oh yeah. And it, it was amazing. I like, I, I didn't know how lucky I was to be growing up at that time. <laughs> but like, I, I was like 14 years old and I was making a lot of money in this. And I, I didn't know, I thought it was brilliant. Little did I know that this was just a bubble and any fool could have been making money for a while until the bubble pops and then all the money goes away. But it was still really cool to be part of that. And I learned a lot about business. I was doing conventions and things like this. I was selling and, you know, I mean, As I a you teenager? Know, pretty much paid my way as a teenager, yeah. I mean, wow. that's pretty much how. I mean, this was, this would have been before eBay and before even I, Yahoo auctions, which, believe it or not, was actually a thing uh, <laughs> back in the mid '90s. Um, so it was before all of that. Like, yeah, I was selling at conventions as a teenager. Um, I knew a lot about um, comic books specifically, and um, I, I always had this one memory of being a kid going to a convention and seeing an artist I really like there. So at a comic book convention, there are often the artists who make the comic books themselves that are there. And I remember seeing this one um, piece of artwork that was the cover of a book I loved. Um, so what happens in cover in comic books? Like literally the artist will draw the page, they'll draw whatever, and then that gets mass produced. But there is mm -hmm. only one of that original mm. piece of artwork that exists. Uh, I remember seeing it as a kid and it was like, I don't know, a couple hundred dollars. Fast forward, I'm an adult, I have some money. For whatever reason that occurs to me, I'm like, I wanna buy that page. you know. And so I go on eBay, not there. I go on all these other sites, I go on some forums, all this other kind of stuff. And I came to the realization that like for certain collectibles, especially collectibles like original comic book artwork, when there is only one of something that exists in the world, it is really hard to find that thing. You know, if you want to find the Mona Lisa, yes, everybody knows where that is at. But for things where there are millions and tens of millions of certain collectibles, mm -hmm. but there's only one of each, um, it's really tough. Um, and so that's what Sketch Maven was. It was scratching my own itch. It was building an online uh, marketplace for original comic book artwork um, with the goal of to expand into other unique collectibles that were underserved by eBay. Like, I mean, I had everything from shoes to all this other stuff on my, on my product roadmap, which, you know, shoes weren't as big of a thing in 2009 as obviously they are now. Mm. Um, but there was just a lot of underserved niche markets that I could build a model for. And so that was kind of the vision for Sketch Maven. So, how did you get original buy-in for Sketch Maven? Did you did you seek funding at the time? Did you self-fund? Did how did that process of sort of getting energy behind yeah. and, and and support for the idea? How did that emerge? It was, it was ground game, honestly. Like, and look mm. to be to be clear, like Sketch Maven, ne it never took off. Um, and but and I had a bunch of successes and I had a bunch of failures. And and dare I say, without that, I would have never have made it to PayPal, which I'll get to in a moment. But you know, to get that initial buy-in for what I was um, trying to do, uh, it was really a ground game. So I was actually uh, on the board of the um, 
Cartoon Art Museum in San Francisco. Um, so I was able to make connections through there. I was going to conventions. I was emailing people. Um, I was spending just all my time just selling, 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 mm-hmm. uh, trying to, you know, and the hard thing about a two-sided marketplace is you need to be building a market for both the buyers and for the sellers. Um, the sellers are not going to come if they're not buyers there. Mm-hmm. The buyers are not going to come if the sellers aren't there. That's the hard thing with a two-sided market. Yes, um, yes. But, um, so yeah, I mean, so I had a whole bunch of tactics and techniques to do that. Um, brought a whole bunch of quantity of, of artwork on there. Um, and just started to build this out. Um, the, the resources I used were actually from a company called Odesk. Uh, Odesk is now Upwork. Um, oh. They were kind of a fledgling company at the time. This would have been like 2008 when I really started this concept. Um, but I was able to hire some developers from overseas to build this out. And to be abundantly clear, I had never built a website before. <laughs> um, so I didn't know what I was doing. Um, and it's sometimes hard to deal with teams on the other side of the world when you don't know exactly what's going on, but I, I learned really quickly. Um, and it, look, it was an amazing experience. Like I said, I had many wins. I had some good press coverage. Like I love seeing things get sold and, you know, all this other kind of stuff. And, um, but the, you know, a lot of things didn't succeed. Um, you know, I, I remember the first time when, um, the site was being like, uh, attempted hacked. I was getting targeted. Mm. Um, and the site was not as secure, dare I say, as it could have been. This is the days before, um, Stripe and Braintree, um, and all of these other ways that you can more easily process payments sure. on the site and no, no credit cards were actually compromised, but like, um, you know, we were getting hacked all the time and actually mm. it was my sister-in-law, um, who told me, cause I was really down. I'm like, I don't know how to handle this. I'm like, I'm getting hacked. Like literally there are all this stuff's happening on the website. Um, and her response to me was like, well, at least that means that you have a site that people care about. And I was That's like, right. wow, what a refreshing way to look at the <laughs> hack. Like, you know, you're only going to get a hack if people think that there's something of value in there. And I never thought of that. Like if I didn't make anything of value, I would have never had all of these hackers on there. And it was just a very refreshing take. Well, well yeah, uh, and, you, and you're so, you were not at all alone. That was sort of, you know, the speed of yeah. innovation in cybersecurity was not necessarily keeping up with the speed of innovation in technology. And so, um, yes. you know, That's right. everyone was sort of asking that question at that time. And it was a challenging time. It, it, it was a completely, I mean, this was, you know, just a little over 10 years ago, but in, in technology terms, it was a lifetime ago. Like now <laughs> you have, like like I said, companies like Braintree, uh, full disclosure, that's owned by PayPal and, and other ways where you can <laughs> very effectively process payments, not have to worry about anything with that. But there's even movements, um, uh, the no code movement. So companies like um, Bubble.io and others that are basically giving the tools where you could actually make really creative websites sites. Um, but you don't have to actually be a programmer yourself, which I was not. Again, keep in mind, I was an accountant with a green visor. Um, <laughs> that that's, was my background. And like to, you know, recreate something like that today, like that's really exciting to me. Like, like the, the whole no code m- movement means that you don't have to have a degree in CS or spend all this time learning how to, uh, how, how to develop something in JavaScript or whatever it might be. And for some most basic websites, you can just use these tools and you could build it out in, in a fraction of the time that it would have taken 10 years ago. It's so true. And I mean, it kind of loops back to our original conversation around influencers and how the speed of you know, being able to get technology to be accessible and then get platforms that can allow yeah. for that same accessibility. It's incredible to see how I think overall we see an increase in the level of empowerment at the individual level. People feel more empowered to be able to have a great idea and give it a shot. There are more resources than ever for being able to at least try. 100%. I mean, and look, what we're doing is removing the gatekeepers. Um, back when I was growing up, there was, you know, um, you know, when I was really young, there was basically just three channels where you could see video content. And then, and then there are VCRs and cable and all this other kind of stuff. And now you have, I, I don't know the exact number, but millions or tens of millions of hours of content being uploaded to YouTube at any given time. Um, like, like it is, it's astronomical. Um, just the influx 
uh, of content and what that means for creativity uh, and innovation ju- just around the world to be able to hear these voices, to see people just build their websites easily. Like, you know, again, you don't have a gatekeeper being a, an engineer to say, well, you're going to have to pay me $50 an hour to build out this site. Well, no, you can actually make a pretty decent MVP, uh, minimum viable product, mm-hmm. uh, by using you know various different no-code tools and see, is this a site that's going to resonate with people? You mentioned creativity. And mm-hmm. I love that in some of your sort of bios and your personal descriptions, you say you're responsible for increasing the creative output of PayPal employees across the company. Can you give us some insight into what that looks and feels like? Yeah. I I, I just want to empower people to be more of what they want to be. I know that sounds so corny, but uh, but work with me here for a second. But (laughs) but but, no, I I, I really. But but I really mean that. Um, Look, there's again, we are all. There's a Maya Angelou quote of like, you know, we're all creative until you know we're four or five, and then we have that creativity just knocked out of us, and and be it because of how how school is structured or parents basically, you know, how, how we act. And believe me, I'm a parent as well. I'm sure I act ways that suppress my kids' creativity all the time without <laughs> me even realizing it. Um, like, you know, we're, we're taught that. Um, and what I try and do at PayPal here is everything I can to get people to embrace that because we have 25,000 employees at this company. Um, and in those 25,000 brains, there are some brilliant ideas. There are some, you know, our, our next billion dollar product is in there. Uh, the next thing that we can build that is going to, um, you know, drastically improve the lives of the next 100 million customers that we're going to be able to introduce to our platform, it's in there somewhere. Um, it's my responsibility and it's the responsibility of management to to tap into that brain trust. Um, and so there's a lot of different ways we do that. Um, you know, one I will just throw out there is we, um, we've created this concept of a global innovation tournament. Oh. Um, and this is something that's been done at many companies in the past, but as many things, we yeah. have our kind of unique PayPal twist on things. Um, and, and we held it last year and we're going to be holding it again in a few months this year. And, and the concept was we went to, you know, we had nine senior leaders from around the globe put forth problem statements, things that they were struggling with, things that they wanted a lot of you know, ideas. They wanted the PayPal brain trust working on. And the ideas and the problem statements ranged from uh, how do we increase our uh, customer acquisition rates, um, you know, five times what the current level is today, to how do we use our products and services to help our customers fight climate change? Mm. Um, And kind of everything in between. Yeah. And... So this was a real diverse set of questions, and we put it forth to all of our employees around the globe. Um, and it was amazing. We, 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 so ideas just started flowing in. And, and, and it didn't matter if you're an engineer or an executive assistant, uh, a designer or a lawyer. Like, like everyone was on the same platform. All ideas were welcomed. Like it didn't matter what your background is um, because we wanted all of these ideas. Um, so we got all of these ideas, um, you know, and then the very first thing that we had to filter these ideas down is we actually have an internal innovation token, which I could talk about later within okay. PayPal that all employees have access to. And we let the employees make the first cuts. We effectively said, you can invest in these ideas. Mm. Um, so it was basically like angel investing. So anybody's idea, you can invest in that. If that idea you know, wins the tournament, becomes a finalist, you're going to get a real nice return on investment 
using these tokens that we have. <laughs> um, and then there was various other stages. We built out the ideas. We, we, we actually did internal podcasts, interviewing people about the different stages and how to build a business and all of these contests. And it wasn't only the people submitting ideas. The entire company went along for this journey. Uh, and it was extremely exciting. It was extremely empowering. And, you know, that's just, you know, one example of how we try to be more inclusive uh, and empower everyone at PayPal to be more innovative. How did you get so much organizational buy-in for this? You know, did you gather thousands of people together in a room? Did you blast this out during huddles or virtually? How did you sort yeah. of uh, spark that? This is going back to my sketch maven days. There's a lot of ground game in this. This is just, it was, <laughs> it was starting out like, cause initially this was just a concept. Yeah. Like we had never done this within PayPal. Again, the innovation tournament concept exists, but nobody could picture it. Like mm -hmm. we had a vision of what we can do and we needed support. Uh, so the first thing I did was I reached out to a senior leader, um, um, who is extremely friendly with the things that we're doing in innovation. And I said, hey, I could really use your help here. Can, can you be the first person to kind of put your name on this? Um, give me a problem statement. We'll work with you directly. Like, let's, let's, let me craft it with you. Like, could you kind of be the archetype? He signed up for it. Awesome. Once he signed up, he had that out there. I went to senior leader number two. I said, hey, Senior leader number one is participating in this. I know you know each other. <laughs> um, how about you provide something? All of a sudden, senior leader two is on board. Then we're starting to actually get, um, uh, you know, build the support there. Um, you know, suddenly we have, you know, nine leaders who are on on this. Um, then we take it to, you know, our CEO and some of our executives have to say, hey, all these leaders are doing this. Can you sacrifice an hour of your time a couple months from now um, where we're going to have a finale and you can be the judge in the finale of this? Um, and he was on board. So then we, we got we got the CEO and all these other people on board. Um, and then you're starting to get a groundswell. So before we had mm -hmm. one idea submitted, we had this whole structure. We were able to get this leadership buy-in. And then once you have all of these people effectively signing off and saying, hey, this is cool, I'm participating, we had them send it out to their orgs, we did a ground game, we reached out to other people and other sites, we have innovation labs all over the world, and we just started promoting like crazy. I love it. And uh, that built this groundswell. And, and I'm really excited because that was the first year we did this. This year is going to be the second year. So now we actually have a brand for ourselves. That's right. Now we actually have leaders coming to us saying, hey, we want to participate in this. Um, and so it, it's completely different. But like, and that's how you start a movement. Absolutely. T tell us about some of the storytelling strategies that you heard um, among employees, especially the ones that sort of earned those early tokens that they needed. Yeah. So, so one of the things we did was for every person submitting idea, they got more of these tokens. Again, the, the, the tokens, and we call them wow within the company. So, so these wow, every employee, just by being an employee, you get some. You get more by you know, submitting ideas on a, in a standard idea portal we have, or even doing things like uh, donating to charities using our internal um, PayPal Gives platform. All of these are things, and many more are ways you earn these tokens. But oh, one so of the ways we did it was sort of already something that the uh, organization understands and uses. Yes, I see. We launched the token system about six months before we launched the tournament, so there was already that familiarity that people had. Um, what, what kind of what what is the actual currency of the tokens? Do, do you exchange it for something? What 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 is the yeah. Yeah, let me say it more. So it's actually, so it's a blockchain-based token system. It's actually based off, so it's an, an, an Ethereum private blockchain, how we run this within the company to get a little bit technical for folks out there. Um, and what we do is we give you all these ways, like I said, where you earn this. Um, there is a news feed, just like you would see in Venmo, which is a, a PayPal product, um, where you would see all the activity in the company. So if you go to this page on our internal website, any employee will see everything that's going on in the company because you could P2P this to other people for just, you know, doing a, you a favor. Or you want to give somebody kudos or whatever it wow. might be. There are many ways to do that. And then finally, you get to redeem these for either swag or cool experiences. Oh. Um, so it's. 
exclusive wow swag that you can't get anywhere else or experiences which run the gamut from um, having me wash your car, um, <laughs> which is one thing. So, and you could take pictures and post on social media channels. Part of how that many, came from the fact that <laughs> how many employees have taken advantage of that opportunity? Yeah, let's just say too many. Let's say too many right now. <laughs> is there a certain hashtag that we can uh, research to see <laughs> these photos? <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. The the reason behind this is because I don't ever wash my own car, and it can be kind of gross and disgusting. They're like, "Well, how about you wash ours?" So I agreed to do that. Um, I, I even got my daughter involved. She she's six. She's adorable, Aww. so she would actually do drawings for people. She loves to do drawings and things like that. So people will say like, "Hey, can you do a drawing of X?" And she will do her darndest to do that, and it comes in a little frame and all that. You know, um, this is to, funny. My, my five year old's favorite. My five year old yeah. daughter. Her favorite thing to do is wash the, the van. She's like, can we clean wow. out the – if she does something special and I'm like, you get a reward, honey. You did so good at that thing. She'll say, let's clean the van. <laughs> You're kidding. Sorry, side I need note. to give her some of these tokens to do my job of washing uh, <laughs> cars right. for yes. other people. They can I'm start their own business. It's going to be great. That's right. <laughs> um, and, and it ranges from that. And it's frankly a way for our leaders to like show a different side of themselves. So totally. um, – my, my my boss, for one, is actually very passionate about tigers and tiger conservation. Mm. So you can actually do a whole session with him to learn about tigers, and he actually even cares for tigers oh. um, as part of that. So you could actually do that. Um, you could go to sporting events with people, um, and you can even do um, Krav Maga, which is basically a type of karate, with our CEO. <laughs> um, so we have leaders at all levels of the organization, and it's also mentorship and things like yeah. that are in there as well. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. And it's well, fun. We let every, yeah, it's what fun. I mean, exactly. Building. And we let every yeah. senior leader basically show a different side of themselves, a that. way that maybe most employees don't typically see. And it's just another way to connect all parts of our organization to each other. And so that's what the platform is. Beautiful. Okay. So stories. What, what did you hear? What sort of helped uh, with, with that initial buy-in for some of these ideas at the ground level? Yeah. Yeah. So here is the really cool thing about this. Like, like we said, so there was all of these ideas and, you know, and we had brainstorming sessions and some people worked as a group. Some people worked individually. There's all these ways they're inspired to get these ideas. But I think the most exciting stories were from that second phase of the process. And in that second phase, if you remember, that's when other people invested in your idea. Yes. And basically the top 100 ideas that raised the most wow would be the ones that made it to the next round. So there's clearly some competition in here. Mm -hmm. um, and this made people get really creative as part of the process. I saw people who basically made their own CRM system. Like, like literally, they <laughs> had this whole system of like email addresses. Here is email one I'm going to send, email number three. They were doing mail merges depending on the response that they were getting from other people, of, <laughs> you know, because they were getting a status of who was investing. Like people I saw just hovering around each other's desks, putting putting posters all over their campus with QR codes. Um, and it was, <laughs> it was so fun because people were allowed to be as creative as they wanted to be yeah. to get other people to support their vision. Um, and, and, and the really fun thing and the unique thing about how we did this innovation tournament is then, so for some of these people, um, like one of our finalists, they probably had about 80 people invest in their idea. What that meant was they had a group of 80 that could that wanted to see them win and wanted to see them succeed. So as they were building out this process and this product, if they need somebody to help edit a video that they want to do a promo for, probably one of those 80 people w had the skills and was willing to help. Yeah. Um, or you know they needed to just bounce some ideas off this group. They could send on a survey to those 80 people and get some immediate feedback on their product. Yeah, and that I was, was really of like one of the user cool testing things about too. this. Yeah, that's really Absolutely. So, so it's really kind Absolutely. of mimics the way that real investing works, where most investors actually become mentors to those startups. So you're really creating a similar kind of culture inside of, of your community. 100%. And that's why, as I said before, we had these podcasts that went along with it. And in these podcasts, they
they would actually, so we had our PayPal Ventures team, which does like venture capital investing uh, for PayPal. They actually explained the whole world of venture investing Mm. at this phase of the process. So this was a way to educate our employee base of like, hey, this is how things like this work in the world. And this is how it's going to work in WOW. And this is how it's parallel to the rest of the world and the types of investing that we see in Silicon Valley and around the world. Wow, that's incredible. You know, so much of what you're speaking to, that this particular strategy of a tournament and building community in this way and building a culture of innovation in this way, I would imagine that it had an incredible impact on motivation among your teams. Can you kind of share a, a little bit more of your insight as to why having a personal stake in innovation, but also getting confidence and being able to share and communicate your your concept and get buy-in for it, how that, what are your thoughts on how that impacts the mo- uh, the motivation of the innovator? Yeah, no, it, it's a great question. And frankly, that is what drove me to take the job that I'm in about four years ago. So I, mm. I started PayPal and products jumping around between a bunch of different jobs as product manager, product analytics. One of my jobs here was leading what was uh, a function called product launch. And so I was leading a team in there. And I remember when I first sat down with my team, um, again, this is just something I'm passionate about. I asked every single one of them, I think there were 10 people at the time, um, do you think of yourself as being a creative person? And I, I remember this so vividly. Like, so I asked everyone in the very first meeting I had, about half said yes and half said no. And that, do- that drove me crazy <laughs> because I'm like, we're all creative beings. Mm-hmm. And again, this, this function is half like program management, half product management. It's one where you just have to be scrappy and entrepreneurial because the whole job of product launch within PayPal at that time was to just get a product a customer loves out the door. Mm-hmm. That was our mission as a team. Just do whatever it takes, find a way to do it. And so you do have to be really innovative and really creative in some ways to, to get people to potentially do their job or get people to do things that are outside of the scope of their job. And you you have to find ways to influence. Um, And so for those five people on my team who did not view themselves as being creative, it became very much my obsession to get them to truly realize that they are. Yeah. That they have it. That, that that creativity and innovation is not something that is just for, you know, the people who wear, um, you know, bright colored clothing or just walk around with MacBooks or or whatever. I mean, this is <laughs> this is something that we just are as human beings. This yeah. is what got us our species to where we're at today. And um, so I, I would do things with that team like. And they hated me in the beginning, to be very clear. But I think they really? g- grew to appreciate this. Well, well, uh, well, you'll see why in a second. <laughs> okay. Well, this may, you'll see in a second why they hated me. It, it was I'm exaggerating slightly for a fact sure. here. But what I did with them, every staff meeting, so we had a weekly staff meeting, the first thing that I would do is I would cold call on somebody. And I would say, tell me something creative that you've done in the past week. So for a person nice. who is not creative or innovative or do, I should say does not perceive themselves to be that – that is really stressful, right? Yeah. And so I am, I am literally putting them on spot here. But what, but what am I doing while I'm doing that? I am forcing them to, the entire week, think about opportunities where they are being creative, where they can be creative. Absolutely. And more so, even just recognize that. So it wasn't even within your work. I remember one person telling a story about he was having problems getting somebody to come to his meetings. Um, and this was a key person. And this person was just not showing up. He did a little bit of research, found out about this person, um, and found out that this person really loved a certain type of donut. Um, <laughs> it was not too hard to to get. And lo and behold, so the person on my team got in a little bit early, uh, made a special trip before coming in, and changed the invite. So it said real big and bold, hey, I'm going to be bringing in donuts from X for these meetings going forward. Um, And that was just one little subtle way to amazingly have that person start to show up to the meeting. I'm like, look, that's not always going to work. But like to me, I'm like, that is creativity. That is innovation to be able to like dig a little bit deeper. Um, But it wasn't always work related. Um, One of the people on my team was from Los Angeles. And so he very much knew about um, traffic. 
And so he actually <laughs> one day when I cold called on him, told a story of how he took this weird winding route into work, going through the airport even, and just like cutting through and doing all of this crazy stuff that was not on ways or anything like that to be able to get into work five minutes faster. Um, and like, and, and again, so this was just a tool. And, and that's why I said my team hated me in the beginning, because when you hear that and you think, well, I'm not creative and you're like, you're going to cold call me to not say to say something I've done in the past week on this. <laughs> um, but they this was just one tool where they really got to recognize that. They got to recognize that, yes, I am creative and it's not just at work in my personal life and all of these other things that I do. I am a creative being. Um, and again, and that was very much the inspiration. So having this team of 10 and doing it with them, you know, when I was had this opportunity to do this kind of at a PayPal level, I jumped on it because being able to do just, you know, for 25,000, what I used to do for 10 that's what gets me excited. That's what gets me, frankly, every Sunday night, I'm super stoked to come into work the next day. Yeah. Um, because I have the opportunity to do this. Tell us some of the stories coming out of your innovation lab now. Yeah. So what we're doing in the innovation lab now, we a lot of what we focus on are proof of concepts and prototypes. Mm -hmm. So many things that are outside of the scope of normal delivery teams within PayPal are the things that we're very much focused on. And w within the innovation lab, it's, we do it in a very unique way. It's basically, we don't have full-time engineers. We don't have full-time designers and all that in innovation here at PayPal. Um, it's very decentralized. So people work on these projects in their spare time. These are passion projects. Um, so we get to build with people in the company really cool things in areas that they're not yet familiar with, but they get to learn. So we get to work on things like augmented reality. We get to work on things like robots um, or maybe even TV commerce. Um, we are the place within PayPal. If anybody has an idea um, that doesn't neatly fit into anything else within PayPal, we're the place to come to because we can help give them the support and the backing. And our only filter that we have for these ideas is if you have a great idea and you want to build something, as long as you can convince a team of people to join you, and we'll help with that. We'll, we'll help at least connect you with people we think might be. But if you could get a bunch of people who are crazy enough to spend their time to work on this with you, that means that that's good enough of an idea for us. And it's something that we want to support. I love how the purpose and the structure of the lab also mimics the tournament. And so you're sort of fostering that kind of thinking across the entire enterprise. And then yeah. if they're ready to take it to the next level and, and start to build or think about scale, it sounds like that's what the lab is there to help support. That's right. That's right. I mean, we, we are there to, you know, initially we're there to build up just the basic skill sets in our company for, for certain areas. And we're there for the company to learn. So when we started doing things in AR, for example, several years ago, we were doing the first augmented reality projects ever within PayPal. And we learned from that and we iterated. And we had, you know, I think when we started, there were about 10 teams at the same time working on projects and they were on different platforms. Some were using Android based, some were mm -hmm. using a Microsoft HoloLens, some were, you know, they were using all of these different experiences and they were learning from each other. It was almost like a six month collective hackathon. I love uh, that was being done within the company. Um, and that way we are just all learning from each other. And then, you know, when we start to see the potential as a company, maybe these proof of concepts, these ideas, they kind of graduate. They move from the lab and they actually become part of the delivery team that's going to be then building these things at scale. That's the basic model that we follow. You know, I think I, I'm imagining the role that story plays in each phase uh, of these kinds of engagements, you know, trying to get uh, the lab to to offer support, to, to understand your idea well enough to be able to point you toward and, and connect you with resources. And then uh, the sort of pull strategy that the innovator needs to use. And I say the innovator, right? It could be any employee, not just the formal. We're all innovators. Sort of, yes, so they're one and the yes, same. Exactly. Yeah, that's right. Yes. And, and so the storytelling that needs to happen to sort of get buy-in and, and, and get energy around the idea. And then 
that critical point where there might be use or there might be an opportunity to collaborate with product to bring it to scale. Tell us what sorts of storytelling techniques or relational techniques have you seen work well in that moment, taking something from the lab and, and bringing it to implementation? Yeah. Um, you know, about storytelling in general, like uh, you can't underestimate the power of story in an organization. I mean, it, it starts at the top. Our CEO, Dan Schulman, um, if we you know, anytime he has a chance to speak to internal, external audiences, he is talking about PayPal's mission to democratize financial services yeah. around the globe. Um, and this is a story that resonates with each and every employee within the company. Uh, it gives us purpose for what we're doing. It's, it's, you know, we're not just like a button trying to make checkouts like that much more efficient. I mean, right. there is a higher purpose in everything that we do as a company. And that needs to filter down to the stories for the organizations and, and you know, for every leader on every team needs to have a story about what, why that team is there. Um, I, I actually, I teach a class in leadership um, at, a, at a local college here. And one of the weeks is on, it's actually on both humor and storytelling. So I kind of <laughs> combine those two in the four hour class. Awesome. But, but like, like storytelling is so critical to the leadership process that we need to understand how it works at a, a high level, a corporate level, uh, and, and a lower level as well um, for any individual team. And I think within the innovation lab, um, the thing that drives story for us, well, I, I think everything starts with story is what I would say. When we were first doing our first proof of concept, we had not really done this within the company, and there was really no charter for us to do this. So what I had to do um, and what this team had to do is like, so there was a team that wanted to work on a blockchain project, and it was a really cool project that they were working on, and we could see like potential for the business and so forth as part of this. Um, but there was no precedent within PayPal. So we needed to create that precedent through story. Um, and what that meant was we needed to put these people on a stage. We needed to kind of track their journey through the company. We needed to, dare I say, make all people who weren't participating in this project with that small team a little bit envious maybe of, of what they were working on because then they could say, well, I could do that or I wanna do that mm -hmm. too. And then they start to work on whatever their passion project is. So, you know, whenever you're starting something new in a company, I think it's great to embrace that and to just bring this full circle now. So, you know, what started with this blockchain project four or so years ago um, has actually evolved to all these other proof of concepts and prototypes. Yeah. And now we're actually building a, you know, I'm currently hiring a full-fledged blockchain team. So it's actually moving from innovation lab to an actual delivery team. And who are the people that I choose for that team? the first people I reach out to are the ones who are working on all these projects part-time. They've built up the skill sets. They, imagine if they've been doing this in their 20% of their time, if they could do all this awesome stuff, imagine what they could do 100%. Um, and that's you know part of the storytelling process. And that then just reinforces all of the other things. So as you know, blockchain moves from the innovation lab to being its own standalone thing within PayPal, whatever the next technology that takes its place this is a story that I'm going to be using again and again and again to reemphasize to say, hey, this could be you. This is the journey that we want to follow. That's incredible. So it's creating a belief and culture and seeing sort of I think it has to do with also um, – building a culture that's comfortable with a pace of change, you know, that that's yeah. not afraid of it, that's that doesn't feel threatened by change, but that it embraces it. And so having stories like that where you say, this didn't used to exist <laughs> and look at all the things yeah. that needed to happen for that to happen. And now you can you can dream bigger as a result of that. And and and, and to, to build on that point, Katie, the one and, and not only being embraced of change, but also knowing that part of the innovative process means that you are going to fail. Yes. Um, and, and, and what failure means is not, again, you shouldn't fail for the sake of failing, um, but that is just how we learn. 
Um, nobody, when, when my six-year-old has a spelling test, if she just looks at the words once and she's not just going to get it right that first time, she's going to go with, a, we're going to work on it at dinner. She's going to get a couple words wrong. She's going to learn. It's going to iterate and she's going to be stronger and stronger. This is just how human beings operate. And this is how organizations need to operate. Um, you know, one other interesting storytelling piece that we're actually working on right now is we're building a physical PayPal graveyard. Um, and so what that means is, so we're building a scaled down version and, and I, and Ben and Jerry's for full disclosure was the first company I actually heard of that did a physical <laughs> version of this. We're doing a scaled down version of part of our campus. Um, and in that scaled down kind of tabletop version of that campus, we're going to have these QR codes, um, that people can scan and there's going to be this like little uh, monitor in the front and it's going to talk about the PayPal products over time that didn't work because in, in, and there's two main things I want to convey through this story. Um, one, just because things didn't work in the past does not mean that they're not going to work today. That's right. We had all of these ideas. This should serve as inspiration. Yeah. And two, the most important thing is we, we need to learn from this. We should not, when things don't work, you shouldn't just sweep it under the rug. Right. You need to go out there. You need to tell people about why this didn't work because somebody might have an idea of how it could work Absolutely. or somebody else might not make the same mistakes that you made from that. Um, and so this is just a very visible way of just of building a physical object that is going to serve as a story, uh, as, a, as a reminder for all of us at PayPal to know what came before and how we can build, you know, even better things in the future. I love the creative approach to that. I think, you know, there's a lot of talk in the innovation community about how we can make sure that, that we do tell stories around failure, that we're not ashamed to do that. And, you know, bringing it to life, it, it's one thing to sort of uh, create an Excel sheet or a Google sheet full of yeah. the list of the things that are on the shelf and, and have an institutional memory for it. But, but bringing, it, bringing it to life, there's something that's physical, that's interactive, that, that has story elements to it. I, I think that that's even more powerful and will create even more awareness and, and institutional knowledge around the history and, and, and probably spark some really interesting conversations and thoughts from, from teams as they sort of look at that together. 100%, Katie. I mean, look, biz building physical things is fun. We, we <laughs> like that. I mean, and especially at PayPal, look, 90 plus percent of what we do is in the world of zeros and ones. Like we're right. building cool products and all that, but it's not actually physical. It's not tangible. So we have a small team of volunteers who has signed up to actually make this physical structure. And it's cool to be able to do this. And we're even learning about like different skills. Um, scales of like models for like um, uh, train sets so we can put <laughs> yeah. little figures in there and all that of like well, okay what's the right scale like it's fun to do all this research and look is this going to lead directly to any product like no we're not going to get into the business of doing this but it is teaching this team how to build something amazing from scratch and it's going to be teaching a great lesson to any employee who's going to be able to walk by this and actually observe and learn from our, our past failures. It's incredible. I, I'm so grateful for the time that we've spent. It's flown by. I have a million more questions I wish I could ask you, but I know that, that we need to wrap up. Would you share any advice that you would give to uh, to people who call themselves innovators, right? We Not necessarily wearing that label in your mm -hmm. job title, but do call yourself an innovator. Could you give any advice in terms of especially storytelling and how to sort of pull that lever and have that as a skill that you use uh, to to be bold and, and get buy-in? 100%. Yeah. Look, I think storytelling is the most powerful thing that you have to get other people on board. Um, if you are just creating great or innovative products and, um, and nobody is using them, well, that's not doing anybody any good in society. You need a strong story around that. Or, and you probably need a strong story to build that team to convince the team that your vision and what you want to build is stronger than whatever other alternative that they have. Um, so, you know, what I would say to people is just learn from 
learn from the best storytellers out there and especially go outside of your core domain. Um, look, I, I, there was actually a podcast recently on Masters of Scale about Charity Water, and it talks specifically about their power of storytelling and um, specifically around a video that they made called The Spring. And The Spring, if no one has seen it, watch it. It is a beautifully produced 20-minute video that is effectively a commercial for Charity Water. I don't think it mentions Charity Water until about 11 minutes into the video, mm -hmm. to be very clear. Um, but, it, but it's an amazing story that is just so inspirational and so empowering that you want to give. And not yeah. because you feel guilty, but because you feel it's the right thing. It, it, it is the right thing to do with your money uh, to do that and to learn from that, to learn from fiction, to learn from comic books, to learn from yes. wherever it is. Like, look at all the stories in the world around you. Take from that and apply those stories to what you do with your teams and what you do within your companies. And if you can really embrace that, it makes you unstoppable. Mike. Thank you so much. I will link the spring video in the show notes. And uh, if you have any other links you want to share, uh, we can we can coordinate and I would love to include those as well. I'm so grateful for the time that you took to talk with us today. It was my pleasure. Thanks so much, Katie. Thanks for listening to this week's episode. Be sure to follow us on social media and add your voice to the conversation. You can find us at Untold Content. 